Hi everyone. Um, welcome to my apartment. Um, we are streaming live from New York City. It's a beautiful day outside. Um, yeah, I'm not going to make any references, but I am going to talk about the number one thing on everybody's mind right now, which is maps. So, um, some of the goals for this session, uh, I'm going to introduce myself, um, a little bit about me, about who I am, brief history of mapping, um, current technology, and getting started with mapping in Ember, and uh, best practices, patterns, testing strategies, um, and I'll leave you with one very important thought. Hold on. So I'll leave you with one very important thought. So a little bit about who I am. Who I, first of all, I am from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, who here in the room is from Tulsa? Um, no, I'm kidding. So, uh, yeah, from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, there I studied social science, political science. I did start off in computer science. I thought I wanted to be a programmer. Um, and then I, you know, my mother was horrified when I switched to political science. Um, but here we are. Uh, although it, it ends well. Um, so I moved to Boston, actually, to earn a master's in studying urban planning with an emphasis in GIS. Um, so there, um, I really discovered that I can combine my two favorite things, which is technology and social science and urban policy. Um, so I was, I was able to, you know, more specifically look at using maps as these sort of, this is really powerful political uh, rhetorical tools um, for conveying and communicating about social issues. So this mapping technology, um, using that to really, to advance a social cause or a policy sort of change. So um, I then moved to New York, New York, uh, which is where we are right now. Um, I took a job with the city planning department and I'm still mapping. So. Um, the end. That's all we have for today. Thank you for... No, I'm kidding. Um, so, what is the City Planning Department? A uh, very simple mission, um, although it's very simple sounding, um, is to plan for the future of New York City. Um, and surprisingly, the City Planning Department is responsible for the future. So, what, what, is this? what this means is any new developments, any new buildings, any desired zoning change, for example, maybe I want to open up a cat cafe down the street, but it's zoned for, you know, I don't know, something else like residential. So I want to tear down, you know, someone's house and open a cat cafe. Um, so I'd probably have to like go through city planning or whatever to do that. I'm not doing that. Um, so, uh, right. So the team I work with is the NYC Planning Labs. Uh, we do software, we are a software development team. Uh, we have two, two main missions, build great technology and modernize um, the way government does technology. Um, so we are, ch we are changing expectations about how government delivers digital services. I like to think that we are. Uh, what does this mean? So agile. Agile, if you will. Will you? No. Um, yeah, this means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, but to us, really, it it's a stark philosophical contrast to what is typical in government, which is the waterfall approach, which is all of your specs are um, asked for up front, um, required up front, and then you, you know, sort of, you're building something for someone, and you get the specs, and then a year later, you come back and you have something that you hate. So that's not good. Um, agile, to us, um, is really simply thinking more iteratively, not just about the technology, but about the relationship with the customer. So, you know, instead of this sort of um, super prescriptive and 
kind of antisocial way of, of building a technology solution for a human business problem, um, we really work closely with the customer. We really we iterate, we learn, uh, and we, we, we react to those learnings um, week after week after week. So demos every week, design sessions, um, etc. Um, open source. So government has a weird kind of um, there's, it depends on who you talk to, but there's there's some fear around open source. There's a lack of understanding, really, about using open source, not so much creating it and providing it, although that's still there too. But using it sometimes there's a you know, is, is this can we trust this? Um, why are we using the enterprise solution? Um, we've always used that before. Um, you know, who are these GitHub people? Whatever. Um, that's the attitude that we're trying to change. Our team um, is fully embrace build, using open source and also open sourcing our own our own products. So uh, we create software as a public resource. All right. So uh, this presentation is not about planning labs, but if you are interested, um, there is a QR code on the screen. Um, I just learned about QR technology maybe last year. Um, it's very cool. Um, it's, I don't know, I just think it's cool. You can open your camera up and then you can get a link, but um, literally just learned how to use that last year. So here we are. Um, so urban planners um, use maps every day. Um, so there's a reason for that. There's, you know, something is being built in the city. You need to know the spatial context of it. You need to know what what is this change in the in the in the built environment? How might it impact business? How might it impact traffic? How might it impact um, you know zoning or or housing in the area? So there's a lot of contextual information that planners really need um, in order to ask the right questions um, in order to, to sort of follow along with with the uh, with, with the guidelines and the policies around uh, zoning. Um, so our flagship application Zola. 1,000 New Yorkers use it every day. Okay, that's not Facebook, but you know it's quite a lot, I think, for you know, a small team. We build this application. Um, city planners use it, advocates, lawyers. Um, a lot of people use it, a lot of different use cases. Um, so some people are, you know, maybe one, exa for one example, you know, where can we build housing? Um, you can use Zola to look at where all of the uh, residential zoning is. Um, and where can I build in a particular neighborhood? Um, is my property in a flood zone? Good question. Um, we can show you if a property is in a, a flood zone 30 years from now or 60 years from now. Um, there is that, that, avail that, that data is, is publicly available to you. Um, you can also look up property information. Okay, I wanna, who owns the building across the street? You know, what, uh, what are the other sort of associated city records for that property? Um, you know, what else can I learn about that property? Um, so all of this is publicly available. Um, so here we are, QR code again. Um, Zola, you know, is a way of really sharing information online, um, making data easy. So there's a big talk about you know, open data and data is available, you know, everywhere, everyone can access data, but um, knowing how to actually have the tools to do anything with data is a totally different question. We hope that Zola is solving, is solving that problem. Um, so give the app a try, um, and hopefully it doesn't break. Uh, no. um, so just a brief history of maps. So there's a, there's a rich historical context behind maps. Um, so it starts with Jon Snow. Um, not that guy, sorry. Um, right. So, uh, Jon Snow with an H. Um, the 19th century English physician, a leader in development of anesthesia, uh, epidemiology, and public health. Um, you know, just as exciting as Game of Thrones. Um, also vegetarian. Um, right, so he has a whole biography um, worth reading another time. Um, but what is he known for? Um, so this is probably a little too familiar sounding, but he is mapping, he mapped, uh, there was a cholera outbreak in, in Soho, London, um, in the mid part of the 19th century. Um, 
and people didn't understand what, what was happening, where it was coming from. So Jon Snow mapped um, the outbreaks and correlated those outbreaks with the water pumps. Now, it's interesting because at the time, he actually, his sort of findings were suppressed by the water company. Um, so it was a bit scandalous um, because the water company had its own sort of interest in protecting us, you know, its business, um, whatever, um, to the detriment of public health. Um, but John Snow was able to use maps to prove his case. Um, so what about mapping beyond sociopolitical, sorry, what about mapping sociopolitical issues? What about so going beyond, you know, public health or even just like, geology and um, these sorts of things. Uh, so, thinky face guy, what's he thinking about? Florence Kelly, uh, I love Florence Kelly because she is a pioneer in mapping technology. Um, she was a late 19th century to 20th century reformer. Um, she was commissioned to study urban slums and factories. So she was a, she was a labor activist um, and she used mapping uh, to illustrate the sort of di the issues in wealth income disparity um, and to really provide a visual kind of um, lesson in wealth inequality. So what you're looking here is an income map um, by block in, in Chicago, um, by, by, by residential block. Um, so these are streets, these are little buildings, um, the black Squares are, you know, what is that, under $5 or something, five or less. Um, and then the blue is five to 10, um, orange, and so on. So what this is actually called technically is a core plot map, but uh, Florence Kelly was one of the first people to actually use this technology, mapping technology to really advance um, a social political cause. Um, so it's technically brilliant mapping tools. So, don't let Jon Snow get all the credit. Um, okay, I don't know, whatever. Um, no, I'm kidding. But if you want to learn more about women in mapping, which you should, um, you can follow this QR code, because <laughs> I love QR codes. Um, so, you know nothing, Jon Snow, whatever. Um, okay, so, mapping tech from print to the web. Um, so, what is a web map composed of? Um, well, first we have a base map, which is stat maps always present. It's sort of a contextualizer. It, it orients the viewer um, to, to, you know, where it is in space. So streets, you know, streets and bridges and, and rivers and bodies of water and parks and things like that. So these are all this typically what a base map is. These are, these are just sort of general terms. Um, but then you have sort of, you know, everything else on top of this. So you have data layers. So these are, these are the sort of maybe focal points of, of, of your map. Um, Polygons, lines, points. Um, yeah, so it's what you're seeing with Zola. So in Zola, you have you know the light gray and blue, um, sort of a contextual map of like this is actually Manhattan, um, just to orient you. But then you can turn on these data layers, which are all these like colorful, kind of looks like a bowl of Fruit Loops a bit. <laughs> it's a little too colorful. Um, that's that. So recent technologies, um, we have ArcGIS. Uh, digital maps and ArcGIS. ArcGIS was uh, is still around, um, still widely used, but I would say maybe in the 90s it was a pioneer in providing wide, uh, widespread commercial access to, to digital mapping. Um, but you couldn't put it on the web, so that was a problem. So in 1996, MapQuest launched its web service. Um, you know, it was great because you can actually, you know, look at directions online and all that stuff. Um, but the problem was, it wasn't very user friendly. So every sort of pan, every zoom, every time you needed to move around the map, triggered a full page reload. Okay, so here we go. Enter the tile. So what are we looking at here? Um, finally, you didn't. You could finally use a map using tile-based technology. You can finally use a map without a triggering full page reload, which is exciting because it's a much better user experience. Those are very cool technology. Um, so how does this work? So there's all sorts of like we call these like slippy maps. Um, so Google Maps, you know, these are these are this is a typical colloquial term for it. Um, so Google Maps is one example. You know, there's OpenStreetMap. Um, there's Ember Map. Wait, 
sorry, that doesn't count. Um, so, sorry, I need to turn on. Um, all right, so how does this actually work? Like I was saying, tiles, um, these are really just images. They're just images that JavaScript sort of, you know, deal, like it, it coordinates uh, mouse gestures and mouse events with the positioning of, of these small images on the screen. So if you actually inspect a slippy map, you can see these are all just tiles. They're associated, these are all just images on a grid. Um, Cats, whatever, everyone likes that. Um, so image-based tiles have limitations. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, so, you know, sometimes, you know, an image based tile, it must be generated on a server. Uh, it, you know, it's, it has limited interactivity, so you can't actually do on the, on the fly styling. There are some approaches that get around that. They're a little esoteric now. I'm gonna do that. Um, so it's, as a sort of solution to that, you can now serve tile uh, information as vector data. That means we have dynamic interactions. We can, um, we can you know, change you know, coloring of things and style and zoom, and suddenly in the GIF you're seeing here, we're actually switching between a point representation of data and um, a polygon representation of data. Um, you can also notice that it you know, using vector tile things, we're rendering this using um, something called Mapbox GL, which actually hooks into the the metal of of, of, a, of the graphics processing unit of a computer. So uh, it's very fast rendering. Uh, this is actually what Google Maps, you know, the web app, uses now. Um, so um, in addition to just being able to do the styling, the the vector tiles also include all the data. So you know, what you're looking at here is probably a core pleth of percent foreign born or percent, sorry, percent of, um, population under 60. I'm switching between here. Um, the different, sort of different core pleth mappings of different statistics. Um, the reason that these can be rendered and styled on the fly um, is that all the data is actually present inside the vector tile itself. So how are tiles made? Um, so we go, do we have here our, um, sorry, um, we have a, through a cylindrical map projection, um, this is a little, yes, so through a cylindrical map projection, we um, are able to project a, you know, globe onto a flat surface. Um, so this leads to obvious distortion. Um, you can all remember middle school geography class, um, all these problems. So there are lots of different ways of projecting things. Um, and, but for our purposes, we use a projection called uh, Wed Mercator. Um, good to know. But to break it down a little bit, assume that in the tiling and tiling something, assume that the world is a square. Um, we feel that way sometimes. It's really not. Um, so for zoom level zero, we have one tile for the world. Um, but at zoom level one, there are four tiles, so you close sort of. If you're if you're trying to zoom in, you kind of you get more tiles. So zoom zero, one, two, um, uh, you get more tiles. So that's the, I like to think of it as sort of a pyramid. Um, good visual. So that's all the, all good to know. Uh, another common format, probably. I don't. It's not even another common format. It's it's actually probably what most people should use for most problems. I would think. GeoJSON. Um, so GeoJSON is good for smaller data sets. It's good for just being able to... <sighs> Sorry, that's my Uber. No. Um, so GeoJSON, it's, it's good for um, smaller data sets. It's good for really um, quick, quick and easy things. Basically, basically the, full, the full spatial data is, is downloaded into the browser. Um, so, you know, if, if you have a very large um, data set, it's not going to work, but for most use cases, you can really get away with GeoJSON, it's fine. Um, so what is GeoJSON? It's just opinionated um, JSON format for, for storing spatial data. Um, so think of it as JSON API, but uh, geography. 
um, map data. Um, so kind of putting it all together. Whoa! Okay, a lot of stuff going on here. Um, all of this really to just do mapping? Well, not always, but um, I would say that for most most use cases, the GeoJSON approach, um, mapping sim with simple GeoJSON is going to work just fine. Um, but for co more complicated map mapping technologies, this is how it works. Um, and I would say for Zola, this is how this is pretty much exactly how we kind of deal with rendering and storing and maintaining all of that data. Um, so that's a lot of stuff, um, but we don't just build it from the ground up. Um, there are these things called cloud services. Uh, uh, Cardo is is one of them. Um, I really like Cardo because it is truly open source. We actually did run Cardo to power. So I'm backing up a bit, like what does it actually do? It takes care of everything you see in the red uh, red circle there. Um, it takes care of all of that. So um, the reason I like it so much is that, like I was saying, uh, you can run it your own infrastructure, it's truly open source, and we actually did do that. You know, there's, there's a lot of companies that talk big talk about, you know, like, it's open source, you can run it. Um, this, we actually delivered live services on top of it for over a year, and we just, did, we just didn't want to maintain, you know, upgrades to it anymore, so we, you know, we were like, okay, let's pay for it. <laughs> um, but really, like, kind of shows how it's like the opposite, like, instead of paying for a service and then figuring out, oh, it's open source, I'm just going to run this myself. We actually had the opposite experience where we were running it ourselves. It proved, we proved the value of it, and then you know we, we run a lot of applications on it still. Um, so sorry, backing up, but um, I would say Cardo is great, but it's not. You don't if, if you're just trying to show a point on a map, you don't necessarily need to use Cardo. Cardo would be overkill for that. Although it is very cool. Um, accessibility. All right, so yes, uh, maps are obviously intended as these sort of visual tools. Um, that doesn't mean that they can't be described. It doesn't mean that um, persons who depend on um, accessibility, tooling, um, or visually impaired, doesn't mean that they can't also be um, enjoying and using maps um, themselves. So we can, still, we can still work on this. We can still do a lot better. So one thing to consider when doing accessibility is to use leaflet.js. The reason for that is um, it's all SVG based. So, you know, some of the maps I was showing you earlier are WebGL based. What that means is that there's a, there's a little canvas element um, and um, that's all. There's just a canvas element. You don't get, you don't get all these nodes in the DOM so you can actually, you can't actually put ARIA information on them. So with SVG based mapping like leaflet, um, you can. You can put the ARIA information on there because you get all those DOM nodes. It's really nice. Um, like I was saying, MapXGL is canvas based, so you just get a canvas. It's really hard to make it accessible. Um, that said, there is an add on called MapXGL Accessibility, which I'm working which you know, I didn't build, but I'm trying to contribute more to. I encourage everyone to, to take a look at it because it's a really cool problem to work on. Um, yeah, so basically, the way it works is. Um, you have your sort of your canvas-based um, DOM node there, and then uh, on the other side, you you know you can have sort of a shadow representation of what's happening in in the map, and it's it's all invisible, but it has it's all sort of DOM representation of you know maybe I have like five points or six points or something, I'll have six DOM nodes for those things, and I'll put some information on them so that you know, and then you keep these two things in sync, and then it really um, really makes things a lot, lot nicer. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, so if you're really interested, I would check out uh, MapBoxGL Accessibility. Um, it's a pretty cool problem to work on. We should, we should make these awesome maps accessible. Um, right, so case study. Zola. Back to Zola. I talk about that a lot. Not the marriage app. Wedding app, sorry. Um, basic features. Many, many, many data layers. Um, map state preserved in the URL. Uh, layer styles shared across other apps, monthly data updates. Um, yeah, so we need all of these things. So, so what does that mean? Um, the easiest way, the easiest way to jump in for us was to use Ember, now called Ember MapXGL. Um, right. So, what is this? It's simply a bindings layer on top of the core Mapbox GLJS library. Um, so it provides you know a really nice declarative. 
um, developer experience. So kind of breaking down what we're looking at here on lines on line three, we have the sort of outer map box component. This is what's actually building that canvas element. Um, it's initializing all the map stuff. Um, it's, it, you know, nothing's really in it yet unless you've told it. That to, so it, a base map will be in it, but nothing else is really in it. No data layers are, are quite in it just yet. Um, but that's what four and lines four and five do. Um, so line four, um, you pass in, again, you see this GeoJSON type, um, and then you pass in the actual GeoJSON data. So that's what the model is going to be, It's the GeoJSON data. Um, yeah, I mean, this, you know, if you look at the GeoJSON specification, any, any GeoJSON you pass into this Mapbox Geo uh, is going to understand it. Um, and then you have this other contextual component on line 5 called source.layer. And that's, you know, that's more responsible for the visuals or the styling of, of that data. So map.source is all the data behind behind the stuff. Um, Source.layer is the styling and stuff. And, and the, the sort of paint uh, property you see there um, adheres to Mapbox.gl's own um, styling specification. Um, so it's, you know, all of this is pretty, the Ember Mapbox.gl add-on, tries to, of course, get as close to whatever the underlying Mapbox-based API um, is, is, is happening. Right, so, so problem. Uh, two sibling components um, who depend on, uh, you know, the same state of something. So, for example, I want to turn on that zoning district's um, layer there. So, um, there's information about zoning districts, such as its state, such as whether it's on, um, that the map needs to know about and then that this men menu needs to know about. So one way we've got around this is how do we, you know, so yeah, sta sharing state across sibling components. So one way we've got around with this is passing in the layer, passing down a, a sort of layer configuration model. Um, so multiple models for each layer, um, pass down to both components. Um, since these are data models, they, they have their own internal state. Um, and the menu can reference it, and then the map component can reference it. Keeps the UI state in sync. We don't have a bunch of weird, like, you know, event buses and stuff like that. Um, the, you know, this is one way of doing it. Um, so, anatomy of the map component. Um, so, you know, when we first started this, you know, you notice that there are several widgets, there are several things going on. You have, you have a print button, you have a measure tool, you have a draw tool, uh, you have you know, all sorts of stuff going on. Um, so our first draft of the map component um, was very, 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 very long. Um, I think this GIF goes to like maybe 400 or 500 lines, which probably isn't that bad in the grand scheme of things, but um, it actually, it was actually interesting because in this case, instead of, you know, reaching for what could have been the wrong abstraction, um, meaning assuming that we know the future and that we're going to need this thing because it feels like we'll probably, and that'll be cool and convenient to have that thing. Um, instead of reaching for that, um, we really allowed this sort of component, this class to ripen a little more before we jumped into kind of refactoring it. So, um, so finally, after it's, it was ready, kind of, it was getting too long and unwieldy, we needed to refactor. So we really knew what the problem was. Now we can start grouping things together. So highlighted feature, um, highlighted, yeah, highlighted um, um, visual feedback. So whenever the mouse hovers over um, a part of the map uh, and you want that visual feedback, all those concerns can be grouped together, put it in a component. Um, you know, the draw tool. So being able to, you know, draw and measure stuff. Um, so all the handling for putting the things on the map when you draw, all the mouse events, um, all of the, you know, little calculations and text and um, being able to switch between um, the unit. Um, take it and put in a component. Um, you know, visual feedback for whenever you select something. Um, so again, component. Um, so one thing I think to take from this is when in doubt, make a new component. Um, you know, one, it's, it's always scary to kind of, you know, start creating a new class for something, but 
I do think, um, you know, you could really easily clean up a lot of a lot of code and a lot of complexity by simply making things into a new component. Sorry. Uh, when a Java make a new component. Okay. So uh, line two, for example, what we have here is um, the measurement widget. Um, we simply pass down the map um, into that layer widget, and um, all the layer concerns happen there. Line four, measurement widget, pass down the map. It's really just sort of separating concerns and just giving things their dependencies that they really need, um, understanding what those dependencies are. All these things depend on a map instance. Um, so, um, makes it easier to test, makes it easier to, to sort of split out things. Um, right. So, lesson here, don't abstract too soon. Um, and, well, this is the next session. Uh, next section, tests. Uh, it's really hard to test maps. Um, if you ever, how do you even acceptance test of, of GeoCamus? You don't. I mean, I've tried. It's scary. <laughs> um, right, so you, you know, you have all these click events, you, you have all these hover events, you want to make sure that visual feedback's happening, uh, you want to make sure that, you know, that you're not going backwards on certain behavior, that things are turning on when they should be. Um, you know, this is, this is all really hard to do with WebGL um, Canvas, but what you can do is use an elaborate stub. So what is a stub? Stub is uh, sort of a mock, it's, I mean, these, these are all sort of loosey-goosey terms. I think some people have tried to really define them. Probably com computer science uh, journal articles can, you know, very clearly uh, talk about what, what that means. But really a stub is just a fake class that you are um, using to mock certain behavior. So instead of using a real map, you could use a fake class and just assume um, that the underlying thing works. So how do you stub a map? Dependency injection. Another probably pattern. All that means, all that means is because we've broken things out a little bit more, um, we have our Mapbox basic map component, uh, line one here. Um, in our testing environment, um, through some of Ember's test tooling, we can stub in um, a, yeah, we can, we can, we can stub in the map instance. Um, so instead of that component you know, yielding out a real Mapbox Geo map, um, you know, like it just yields an instance, we can stub it and then hand it a kind of dummy object. And all of these methods here, add layer, add source, get source, these are all actually Mapbox GL uh, API methods. Um, I have seen some Mapbox GL add-ons um, use elaborate stubs for this reason. Um, it's not always the best thing in the world, um, but it has worked really well for us. Um, another tricky part is that Mapbox GL is event-driven. Um, so, you know, how do you simulate a mouse move event? An underlying Mapbox GL detects ma mouse move, and then it, you know, it triggers the callback for you know your app's handling for what happens when a mouse moves. Um, you know, I was what, something that's worked for us is to um, use something like what we're seeing here, which is um, just uh, manually within your test actually trigger that behavior and give the callback signature that you know is needed for whatever your your own app's callback function is. So you know, this way you're actually triggering the behavior in your app and testing it. Um, but real talk, you know, this has worked really well for us, but you're really not supposed to mock what you don't own. Um, so, you know, I don't love, I don't love this solution, but it has, it has, you know, in the absence of any testing, this is working really well. Um, I think ideally in the future we go back to Mapbox GL accessibility. Um, actually in building out that add-on will really help us deal with, um, using real mouse events, um, using real clicks to actually test behavior on the map. Um, so, but we need to build that out first. Um, but also, yeah, seriously, so like don't mock what you don't own is is the general advice, but let's, you know, we're, we can be reasonable. Um, so no more aggressions, we hope. Um, yay. 
All right, so with great power comes really cool maps. How to lie with maps. Um, so I kind of, this is the very important message I wanted to end with, which is maps are very powerful rhetorical tools. Um, they um, are things that everyone sort of identifies with. We identify with place. You can point where you live, where you've been on the map. Um, and, you know, what, I like this quote a lot because it's, um, you know, map users, you know, we, we kind of just, we kind of just assume and trust the map. We trust maps exist, or we trust the map is a representation of reality. So this is an example, this is a great example of how, you know, how easy it is to rhetorically misinterpret um, a map. So what you're seeing on the left there is um, recent presidential elections. So these are um, uh, how people voted. Uh, sorry, uh, this, this is how, how people voted. Um, yeah, so on the left there, um, you're looking at uh, the, the election results by county. Um, but if you normalize the election results um, by population uh, distribution, um, you actually get a totally different picture. It actually looks much closer than you could understand in the other in the other one. And there was one map in this slide that you're seeing that was shared a lot by one party, and um, well, I won't get into that, but um, this is a great X, what is it called? X, XKCD or something? I don't know. Um, it's really just my biggest pet peeve also um, is, you know, you can't just, just spatial correlation um, doesn't mean that there's actually a real relationship between these things. Most of it's just a function of population. So we can see, for example, in this Twitter data tweet, um, uh, you know, this is in 2013, there was a lot of excitement about web mapping. It was much more accessible, possible to, to use mapping, digital mapping tools. There's a lot of that, that hashtag mapped thing. Um, you saw a lot of McDonald's being mapped, but you will see that, they, that these are largely just functions of population density. So. Um, on the Twitter uh, data's map there is uh, tweets during the election, and then on the right is population density. So, um, I mean, I love looking at a cool map, uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's between rhetorically dishonest or just not that interesting. Um, that's okay. Um, you know, another thing, augmenting a message through maps. Um, there's obviously graphic design choices that could be made. You know, you have this, on the left, we're talking about, you know, gun death. Um, we have, you know, raging epidemic. It's black and red and um, there's a crosshair on it. Um, and, and then bottom left, actually, what you see is these sort of granular bins. So it creates a lot more, like, kind of, I don't know, visual no not yeah, a little bit more visual noise, I guess. Um, makes it just look kind of grislier. And on the right, you kind of have the opposite rhetorical angle. Um, you know, the title, um, fewer bins on the bottom left. Um, you know, and you're describing not describing as violent deaths. You're describing as incidents, um, incidents per you know hundred thousand or something. Um, these are choices that you can make. So. Um, yeah, so thank you all for joining me in my apartment. Um, I, the city I'm learning is a lot of us are working from home now. Um, never thought that would happen, but, um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, please reach out on Discord, um, if you have any questions. Um, yeah, and thank you.